Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Akshay Sethi. I manage OSA's Corporate Membership Program, also known as OIDA. I'm really excited to introduce today's webinar. It's sponsored by one of our corporate members, Menlo System. Right before we get started here in just another minute, I want to just take a moment to review a couple of housekeeping items. So if you need any assistance on today's call, um, please use the chat box to message me privately. Um, this is if you're having any technical issues, if you have any logistical questions, I'm here and available to help and assist you. During the webinar, we also really encourage you to ask our speaker questions. We have several folks from Menlo on the call today. Some of them are supporting the Q&A role specifically. So we really encourage your questions at any point during the webinar, um, and they'd be happy to get in touch with you and help assist you with any of your um, questions. We ask that you send all of your questions using the Q&A icon. It's also located at the bottom of your screen. Um, be sure to just type in your question and hit submit directly. As a final reminder, this webinar today is being recorded. So we will be posting this on our website in about another couple of days. I will drop a link in the chat box here shortly on where you can find the recorded webinar definitely before the end of this week. So that's everything that I have for um, housekeeping items. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Patricia to get us started. Thank you. Okay. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Thank you, Sakshi and the OSA for carrying out this webinar. And uh, with the first, for the beginning, I would like to briefly introduce our company for those who are maybe not so familiar with us. So Menlo Systems has been founded 20 years ago as a spin-off from the Max Planck Institute um, for Quantum Optics near Munich. We are developing and manufacturing lasers and laser stabilization for high precision metrology applications. Menlo is known for the Nobel Prize winning technology of the optical frequency comb. Our co-founder, Professor Hench, was among, was among the Nobel laureates in 2005 for this invention. Our headquarters are in the west of Munich in southern Germany, and we hold offices in the US and in China. We work together with customers worldwide with applications in science and in industry. The optical frequency comb has remained our main product and our combs are worldwide unique in terms of stability, accuracy and reliability. We also provide frequency comb stabilized lasers, frequency stabilized lasers with subhertz line with output and we combine these lasers with optical combs to build complete systems for quantum technology. Further, we provide also solutions for terahertz time domain spectroscopy and systems for timing distribution in large facilities. We also offer femtosecond fiber lasers as standalone devices and our patented figure nine mode locking technology ensures highest stability and low noise performance. Our main speaker for today will be Dr. Doug Schmidt, who is product manager for optical frequency comps in Menlo. Assisting with the Q&A session will be Dr. Ben Sprenger, who is regional manager in Berlin and expert in quantum technology and metrology. And there will be also Dr. Sandra De Vega, who is sales engineer for optical frequency combs and ultra-stable lasers. So this is the first part of our mini series. The second part of this webinar will be held on Tuesday next week at the same time. The registration is open now. We encourage you to submit questions during the webinar and there will be also a short poll in the, in the break. For now, I'm handing over to Doug. Thank you very much, Patricia, for the kind introduction. So as announced, our today's uh, talk is entitled with why would I need an optical frequency comp, a brief introduction to comps and applications. And this is exactly what I want to start with, um, with the frequency comp basics. After that, I want to show you our frequency comp solutions from Mendel systems. Of course, I want to show you how our systems look like, how the comps look like, and also how the ultra stable lasers look like. And then the main part of our talk um, 
will be about the applications of frequency comms. And last but not least, we will have a little product demonstration about the smart comp. All right, so let's get started with the uh, yeah, very basics, I would say. I would like to claim that most of the lasers today we use in our laboratories um, can be divided into two classes. Uh, one of them are the continuous wave lasers, the CW lasers, and the other class are the pulse lasers. So as we all know, a continuous wave laser in an ideal world would emit an electric field, which is perf perfectly uh, sinusoidal, and the spectrum of such a laser is just one Laurentian peak. Um, for pulse lasers, of course, they emit pulses, as the name says. And the time between those pulses here is given by a time t. And this is the inverse of the repetition rate. And the repetition rate really is yeah, uh, how many pulses per second are leaving the cavity. And the spectrum of such a pulse laser looks like this. It has a multiple of spectral lines, and they're all separated by this repetition frequency. Now you might say, yeah, well, this indeed looks like a comp in the frequency space. So is this already a frequency comp? Well, not yet. Uh, we have to take care about two parameters. So let's have a closer look uh, to the spectrum of a pulse laser. So uh, the spectrum of a pulse laser can completely be characterized by two parameters, the repetition rate, which gives you the spacing between these spectral lines and an offset frequency. So what is this offset frequency? Well, if we expand the spectrum in mind down to the RF domain and down to the real frequency zero, then the first mode here, well, F0 mode, will not hit zero in general. We will see on the next slide where that is the case. Um, but the repetition rate is constant over the entire spectrum. Well, you might doubt that, but I will explain on the next slides why that is the case. And uh, you might ask yourself about uh, this offset frequency, about the origin. Why is there an offset to zero? And how do we measure and stabilize F0? All right. So to understand how a pulse laser works and to understand why the repetition rate is, is equal for all frequencies, we have to have a closer look at a so-called mode locking mechanism. So what I've written here on top is just the resonance condition of a standing wave cavity of length L. And you can rewrite that in the sense that it says n times lambda half fit into a cavity of length L. This is a bit nicer, I would say. And what I've plotted here on top are the first four eigenmodes of such a standing wave cavity. And on the bottom part, you see the superposition of these modes. To be 100% honest, this is the superposition of the first 16 eigenmodes, because if you only take four, then you do not get such a nice pulse shape. But for clarity, I only wanted to show you the first four on top, because uh, 16 eigenmodes oscillating are very confusing. And now I start this little animation here. And indeed, we see the oscillations of these eigenmodes here lead in total to a pulse traveling back and forth in the cavity. All right, so these eigenmodes are oscillating with their given eigenfrequencies, but what is the mode locking now? Well, mode locking means that these eigenmodes here, let me change to laser pointer, that the eigenmodes here are synchronized not only in space, they're also synchronized in time. And you can see this if you keep an eye, for example, on the first mode here on the lambda half, if this blue mode here crosses zero, all the other modes will also cross zero. I'll start the animation again. So you see, there it goes through zero, all the modes are oscillating through zero. So they are synchronized in time, and this is the crucial part here of the mode locking mechanism. So this mode locking mechanism leads to stable pulse laser operation, as we can see here, a pulse traveling back and forth. It does not change its form, a stable pulse. And this also ensures that all these spectral lines of the, pump, uh, of the pulse laser are equidistant. And this was quite, uh, quite much of effort was put into that. And uh, in 1999, when the first frequency comp was invented, the group around Theodor Hensch, uh, including Thomas Udem, Jörg Reichert, and Ronald Holzwart, who's now CTO of Mendel Systems, they were able to show that not only for pulse lasers and especially for frequency comps, these modes are really equidistant. And they showed this on a level in only a few parts of 10 to the power of 18. So to really, really, to any known application so far, you can really assume that a frequency comp has equally spaced modes. All right, so this is mode locking, but I haven't told you how we get a laser to this mode locked operation, to the pulsed operation. Well, therefore you need a special cavity design. And of course there are many different techniques uh, available, but what they usually have in common is that the cavity is designed in such a way that you introduce high losses for relatively low intensities. So CW laser operation is suppressed 
and you want low losses for high intensity. So pulse operation is supported. So if you compare here two lasers, a CW laser, sorry, a CW laser and a pulse laser with the same average power, well then of course the peak intensities of the pulses here are much higher than the average power of the CW laser. And this is how, yeah, this is how we can separate between pulsed and CW laser operation. And in the case of Menlo, we're using the so-called figure nine technology. This is a technology which is based on a nonlinear amplifying loop mirror. And it works with phase shifts between counter propagating pulses rather than with separable absorbers, which has a few advantages. And yeah, this is a worldwide patent and technology. It's an all polarization maintaining design and it gives you intrinsically very low noise fiber based laser oscillator. All right, so one thing is missing here in this uh, very uh, simple animation, and this is dispersion. And so to go one step further, this is a little bit closer to reality. Of course, this is also a very simple uh, animation here, but what I've drawn here is a cavity. And since a real life cavity always includes optical elements, this can be described as a dispersive medium. And if you have dispersion, then in general, the phase velocity will not equal the group velocity. So if we have a pulse here traveling back and forth in the cavity, I'll show you what happens. Well, the carrier will drift relative, <clears throat> the face of the carrier will shift relative to the envelope. And of course, this phase shift is then imprinted in the pulses which are leaving the cavity and continue traveling here in a non-dispersive medium. So this intracavity dispersion induces a carrier envelope phase shift, delta phi, between the pulses which are leaving the cavity. And this is the origin of the offset frequency. The offset frequency is also often called the carrier envelope offset frequency, so FCO. In my talk, I call it F0. And you see here this delta phi divided by T. So this is really the rate at which the carrier phase travels in relation to the envelope. All right, and now we have everything we need to summarize what a frequency comb is. So in the time domain, it is a, in our case, it's a femtosecond pulse train. And the pulses are the pulses are separated by a time t, which is the inverse of the repetition rate. Um, from pulse to pulse, there's a phase shift of delta phi. So here we have one delta phi, here we have two delta phi, and so on. And if you have a look at the spectrum of this, this phi leads to an offset frequency here, and the spectrum is separated. The spectral lines are separated by the repetition rate. And this means if the repetition rate is equal for all uh, for all frequencies here, what we've shown on the last few slides, this means that any comp mode here with index n can be expressed as n times the repetition rate plus f0, where n is an integer number. You can start counting at zero if you want, then it says f0 is f0, this is obviously right. You can also start counting at one, this uh, is doesn't matter. But this is really, this is, yeah, we call it the comp formula, and this is a very, very important formula. It's uh, also very beautiful, I would say, but this directly shows you the, yeah, the most important feature of a frequency comp. It divides an optical frequency, for example, 194 terahertz, it divides it down into a repetition, an integer number of the repetition rate plus F0. And the repetition rate and also F0 are in the megahertz domain in the RF domain so they can be easily counted with frequency counters. And this is really the clue of the frequency comp. What I haven't told you so far is how do we measure these two frequencies. The repetition rate is quite easy. We just shine the laser on a photodiode and if you connect this photodiode then to a um, RF anal spectrum analyzer you will see the 250 megahertz and all the higher harmonics. So this can be measured directly with a photodiode and counted then with a frequency counter. This is not a problem. F0 is a bit more tricky. And this was uh, the idea of uh, Theodor Henstein. If we assume that our frequency comp here spans a complete octave, this would mean that we have a mode here. Let's call this mode number n. And then there is a blue mode here, which has an index of 2n, because the comp is broad enough to span a full octave. And according to this formula here, the frequency of this red mode is given by n times the repetition rate plus f0. And the frequency of this mode is given by 2 times n times f rep plus f0. And now what we do, we're sending the red part here, we're sending the light through a crystal, which does second harmonic generation. So this formula here gets a two, uh, or the, uh, gets a two factor of two here. And then we superimpose these two light fields on a photodiode. And the photodiode gives you the beat signal, and the beat signal is 
exactly the difference between those two frequencies. And indeed, this adds up to be exactly F0. So we can measure both. And if we can measure both, we can also stabilize both of them. And this um, brings me to the most important application, I would say, of the frequency comp. Because, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Yeah, this is then the definition of the frequency comp. So we define here an optical frequency comp is a pulse laser with stabilized repetition rate and carrier envelope offset frequency. And the main common application here is the optical frequency ruler. So if you want to measure the frequency of a CW laser with a comp, what you do, well, you simply measure a beat signal between the comp and the CW laser. And we have all the modes here from F0 up to Fn. And then from the picture, you can directly see the frequency of the CW lasers given by Fn plus F beat. And from the picture, you can also see that the absolute value of the beat signal can only be in between zero if it's uh, directly on a comp mode in between zero and half of the repetition rate, because if it's further away, you measure the beat signal to the next comp mode. So this means measuring a CW laser breaks down in the end to measure the beat signal and maybe F rep and F zero, but from our qualification measurements at Menlo, you already know that the comp modes here are, yeah, they are reliable and quite accurate. So if you just read the values, the set values of F zero and F rep, you can be sure to a very decent level that this frequency Fn is known. And then it break, the measurement of the CW laser breaks down to the measurement of a beat signal. So what is missing now is the integer number n here. So how to determine the comp line index n? Well, the easiest way is just to measure the CW laser with a wave meter, which is a reasonable accuracy, which must be better than half the repetition rate. Then you can just use this formula and divide it and get uh, the number n, which will of course then not be an integer number uh, precisely, but then you round to the next integer number and you know that this is the correct mode you're measuring at. Or you measure F beat and F rep for vastly different values. For example, you can detune the repetition rate uh, in case of the Menlo comes from 248 to 252 megahertz. And from these two measurements, you can also calculate n. Or if you're very lucky and you own two frequency comps, you can do basically the same measurement at one time and measure the beat signal for vastly different repetition rates at a time. All right. <clears throat> so now, how do we really stabilize a frequency comp? There are two main ways to do that. And the easiest way is to lock your frequency comp to a radio frequency reference. So what I've plotted here, you see here in one box, we have the figure nine oscillator and we have a preamplifier. And we just shine the light on a photodiode and this detects the repetition rate. We feed this back to the locking electronics. Inside the locking electronics, there's of course a phase detector, which then compares this 250 megahertz repetition rate with the reference. And yeah, the locking electronics then locks this to the reference signal and there's a slow and a fast feedback here. One part of the preamplifier here is used to seat a further amplifier, which then drives the so-called F to 2F interferometer, which I was just talking about, the octave spanning comp. And then we detect on this photodiode here, the CEO beat signal and feed this back to the locking electronics. So what happens in frequency space? Well, then if you lock both of these parameters, everything is fixed. F0 is fixed to the value uh, you just define here by your reference and the repetition rate, so the distance between the comp lines are also fixed. So everything's fixed. And the advantages of this setup are obviously that it's quite simple. Um, and all comp lines are stable in the absolute frequencies. And for example, if you get your radio frequency reference here from an atomic clock, if you're very lucky, then you have your comp linked to the SI second and you have an extraordinary good long-term stability. There are also Sorry, some uh, disadvantages. And this can be seen from the comp formula again. You see the optical comp modes here are given by n times the repetition rate. And this n factor here is on the order of 1 million. So this means if you have a noisy RF uh, reference, then this is upconverted to the optical domain. So there's always an upconversion of RF noise, and the scaling factor is n squared. So this indeed means that you cannot lock your comp very tightly to a radio frequency reference. It is more used to keep um, the center of your lines at a certain position and keep the, the distance between the lines constant. But uh, the line width itself is mainly given by the free running line width of the laser. And this is around 50 kilohertz in the case of the Menlo comps. And if you need a very small line width of your comp, uh, 
much smaller than 50 kilohertz, you would have to lock your comp to an optical reference. And how would that work? Well, as you can see here, nothing changed for the CO beat path. We do not change anything for the CO beat, but we open here the loop for the repetition rate feedback. And now we close the loop outside. We take a part of the pre-amplified light here and send this into a so-called beat detection unit. The beat detection unit is uh, in principle a combiner and a filter. And here in the speed detection unit, the light from the oscillator is superimposed with CW laser light from a high finesse cavity, for example. Usually they operate in the C band. And then you detect on the photodiode the beat signal between the comp and the CW laser. So again, what happens in frequency space? No changes here for F0. But here we have the ultra stable laser. And what we lock now is the distance between the ultra stable CW laser and one comp mode. So we do not lock the repetition rate in this case. This is uh, important to understand. The feedback here really gives you the distance between comp and CW laser. This is the thing you lock. So if you detune the cavity or if this would move a little bit, the comp would follow by adjusting its repetition rate, keeping delta F constant. So the advantages of that are you can do spectral purity transfer. What does that mean? This means that the subhertz line with op the optical reference system is <clears throat> transferred to every comp line. And this includes also our wavelength extensions. So on the complete spectrum from 520 to 2100 nanometers, we can produce subhertz line width on all comp lines. And the other advantage is that if you detect this light uh, of the frequency comp, which is now locked to the ultra stable cavity on a fast photodiode, you get ultra stable microwaves. And this is uh, exactly the other way around. Uh, like I told you before on the slide before I said there's a problem with the up conversion of the RF noise. This is correct. And here we use this <clears throat> because here the um, optical reference already has a very, very good phase noise, um, a very, very low phase noise. And if we now lock the comp to that and detect the light on a fast photodiode, we do not only divide down the optical frequency down to the repetition rate of the comp, we also divide the noise of the optical reference down by a factor of n. So also the noise is divided by a factor of roughly 1 million. And this in the end, yeah, then in the end you get record-breaking ultra-stable microwaves. As a disadvantage, well, of course, you need an ultra-stable CW laser. And the good news is that you can uh, buy a complete system from Menlo Systems. But of course, this is then a bit more expensive than only the comp, but still, these are very, very nice systems. And uh, another disadvantage is that due to aging effects, these cavities drift a tiny little bit. So there are long-term cavity drifts. They are in the order of five megahertz per year. So really, really slow drifts. And you can get rid of them if you measure them. So if you have a second absolute reference like GPS or atomic clock, and if you measure these long-term drifts, you can then feed back these long-term drifts to the locking electronics and correct basically the set value of this delta F here. So then this ultra stable laser could a little bit drift over the time, but you're still keeping the comp modes constant for all times. And this would be the, yeah, like the best way to stabilize a frequency comp. Okay, so I now said uh, we can do spectral purity transfer. I can, of course, claim a lot, but can we also prove this? Yes, we can. How do we do this? Well, we take an ultra stable laser, uh, USL in short at 1542 nanometers, and we lock our frequency comp to the laser. Then we have a Wavelex extension, which also goes to the visible domain. And now the claim is that the comp copies the spectral purity of the ultra stable laser to all comp lines, and that this is a unique feature of Menlo Systems patented figure nine ULN technology. And how do we show that? Well, we take a second ultra stable laser, this time at 729 nanometer, and just have a look at the beat signal between these ultra, the ultra stable laser and the comp line here. And as you can see here, the beat line width at 729, uh, 729 nanometers is smaller or equal than 0 0.3 hertz, full width half maximum. And this, the red dots here are just the raw data, no division by a factor of square root two or something, nothing done here. This is just the raw data and the fit. And uh, indeed, uh, we know that this is limited by the ultra stable laser itself and not by the frequency comp, because if we compare two ultra stable lasers at the same frequency, we also get a beat signal, which looks like this. So we know in this beat here, well, you cannot really see the line width of the comp, so it must be less than 0 0.3 hertz, which is, I would say, quite impressive. And to give you an idea, here in this uh, picture, of course, there's uh, maybe uh, 25 modes or so. In reality, the frequency gap between these two ultra stable lasers is 217 terahertz, 
which corresponds to 870,000 compliance. And all of these compliance, obviously, yeah, all of these compliance have subhertz line with which they, yeah, which they got from, from the ultra stable cavity. All right, um, after all these uh, schemes, I want to show you, of course, also the real systems. So here it is, the FC500 ULN optical fre frequency comp system. You can see this is divided into two parts. We have a base plate here with the optics and we have an electronics rack, a 19 inch rack. So here, uh, in one box, you will find the figure nine oscillator and the preamplifier. The other box is the F to 12 interferometer. And there's a housing, and if you need it for long-term stability, a water-cooled base plate. And this is then connected to the electronics rack. In the electronics rack, there's a computer. There are also different control units for the fiber oscillator and the amplifier. And of course, the locking electronics is included. And here we have a 24-inch touchscreen, keyboard and mouse. And this is a complete metrology system we have the software, comp control and comp watch included, and also USB oscilloscope spectrum analyzer to show you the error signals of the two feedback loops. So in total, this is a 19 inch, one meter 60 rack, 70 times 70 times 14 is the base plate. And uh, for this core system here, you would get up to eight custom output ports in this wavelength range here in the infrared, 10 milliwatts each. The repetition rate of these systems is usually 250 megahertz and we can offer wavelength extensions from 530 nanometers to 2.1 micrometers. Four channel daytime free counters are also included and if you need it, also 10 megahertz reference. And the fractional accuracies and stabilities we can reach here within a short amount of time is on the 10 to the minus 18 level. I will explain in detail next week how we do these measurements. These are done in an out of loop direct comp comp comparison. And on the other hand, we have the very compact and tiny smart comp. We will uh, show you at the end of the of the webinar. And uh, yeah, this is a 19 inch rack mountable three height unit device. And as you can see, everything is, is inside here. It's a fully automated turnkey device. Here you have uh, only three outputs, but you can have up to six outputs and two inputs on this front panel here, a seven inch screen, uh, seven inch touch screen and full remote control via Ethernet and USB, and everything is included in this. So the figure nine oscillator with preamplifier, the interferometer, and also as a standard, a 1542 beat detection unit for fiber link connection is, is included here in the optics. And the phase lock loops for repetition rate and offset frequency stabilization is also in here. So this is the complete core system. And on the other side, I want to show you the ultra stable lasers. These are also uh, completely rack mounted systems here. On the bottom part, we have the cavity in the vacuum chamber. You can see a CAD drawing here with the iron getter pump and the cylindrical cavity in the vacuum chamber and the optics mounted here. So there's a picture of the cylindrical spacer. And of course, the electronics is included to do a pound river hall stabilization of the CW laser to the cavity. We have the iron getter pump controller and also displays for the error signals. And these systems, well, you can order CW lasers here from 600 to 1,600 nanometers, and the fractional stability can go down below 7, 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus 16 in one second. So you definitely have subhertz line with on these lasers. And also here we have a second more compact, the RS cubic system, which is only eight height units high. The CW lasers here are at 1542 or 1064. We use this cubic cavity here. Uh, <clears throat> And we can offer here a line with below two hertz. So slightly reduced specs, but also a very compact and very robust and rigidly mounted cavity inside this box. All right, now before we come to the applications, I want uh, we want to have a little webinar poll. So two questions here. So the first question would be, what do you consider the most important feature in a frequency comp system? And I think you can only choose one because it says most important feature. So would it be ultimate stability and accuracy, compactness, transportability, versatility, or something we didn't think about? And I think for the next question, you have multiple options. Which applications are you most interested in? Comp as a replacement for multiple CW laser references, high accuracy metrology, optical lattice clocks, or direct uh, sorry, um, optical networks and fiber links, direct comp or dual comp spectroscopy, or ultra stable microwave generations, or something else. I think we give you a few more seconds and we appreciate your feedback. The 
waiting for a couple more people to respond and then we'll have about 50 percent of everyone's votes mm-hmm. and then we can share these with everyone for review I apologize for some reason it's not letting me end the poll, um, but I, I guess I can read off the answers that were submitted as the most popular. Okay. Um, so for the first question, the first answer, answer choice was um, selected by 54% of the audience. Um, and for the second question, there was a pretty even split between high accuracy metrology and the direct comb or dual comb spectroscopy. And there All were right. about 42 and 43% respectively for each of those choices. All right, thank you very much for your feedback. Great, so now, uh, ah, there it is. There now we can see it. All right, cool. Thanks a lot for your input. So now I would like to talk about the applications. Of course, uh, frequency comms has a, is a, just a gigantic field of applications and don't worry, I will not go through all of them. So those of you who uh, clicked on optical lattice clocks, I have to disappoint you for today. Uh, optical lattice clocks and also ultra low noise microwaves will be part of next of the next webinar in one week. But we will talk about the other applications here. And I want to start with high accuracy metrology because high accuracy metrology was really the driving force behind a frequency comp, I would say. So already in 1978, Eckstein, Ferguson, and Theodore Hench published a paper in which they used picosecond light pulses for high resolution two photon spectroscopy. And this was really a brilliant idea because they <clears throat> obviously recognized that a pulse laser has a comp type structure and you can use it to measure frequency distances. And why was this so genius? Well, because if you plug in your pulse laser to an optical spectrum analyzer, you cannot see the frequency comp directly. You just see a very broad and maybe also fractured spectrum. And this really doesn't look that nice. And it certainly does not look like a high-end laser capable of doing precision spectroscopy. But, But they really believed in the inner structure due to the mode locking mechanism, and they were right. And uh, in 1999, when the frequency comp was invented, this was really a breakthrough for high accuracy metrology, because as you can see here, one very popular and important example, what I've shown here is the fractional accuracy of the 1S, 2S hydrogen transition frequency, which oscillates at around 2.5 petahertz. And before the invention of the frequency comp, the fractional accuracy was in the mid 10 to the minus 13 level here. In absolute numbers, I think this was known to around 860 Hertz. And after the invention of the frequency comp, this value dropped massively by a factor of 20 down to only 40 Hertz in the low 10 to the minus 14 range. And then due to improvements in experimental, uh, in the experimental setups, this could even be improved down to the 10 to the minus 15 fractional accuracy domain. And today frequencies can be determined and synthesized with highest stability and accuracy of all physical quantities. And you can see the impressive results of uh, the fractional stability and relative uncertainty of optical clocks today, they reach the low 10 to the minus 18 level, some of them even 10 to the minus 19 level. So Arthur Shafloff was uh, pretty right when he recommended never measure anything but frequency. So not only uh, spectroscopy, uh, guys from spectroscopy uh, like frequency comp, also for length metrology institutes, a frequency comp is quite a handy device. And uh, that's why we decided in 2018 to do a little road tour with our smart comp. So two of my colleagues rented a car and drove uh, from Munich to Vienna to Bratislava and then to Prague and then back to Munich, uh, pretty much circling around Budweiss, which is a shame of course, but this was a business trip. And yeah, they took the smart comp with them and within three days, they visited three countries. They calibrated five metrology lasers simply using the smart comp. And the lasers are seen, you can see here in the tabula, four of the five, five lasers were helium neon lasers and one was an acetylene stabilized DFB laser. 
And here you can see the laboratory of Dr. Matos on the left and my two Menlo colleagues here. And on the optical table, you see the smart comp, the white box. Dr. Matos is a wise man, so he also has a FC1500 scientific platform here. And I think now he also owns an ultra stable laser from Menlo. And if I'm not mistaken, the helium neon laser they wanted to calibrate and was calibrated is the black box here. So what did they do? The smart comp was locked to 10 megahertz maser reference. So the Institute in Vienna offered, in Vienna offered uh, the 10 megahertz maser reference and a maser is really the gold standard of RF references. So there's nothing better to lock onto if you use radio frequency references. And then they did a 16 hour measurement of the BEV1 laser. And the result was uh, an offset of three kilohertz relative to the recommended value of this 473 terahertz value given here. But this does not mean that the measurement was done wrong or something's wrong with this laser. This is a known issue with the helium neon lasers. They age over time and they drift a little bit in frequency. So this plus three kilohertz was in perfect agreement with previous results. Dr. Martos, a few days before uh, my colleagues visited him, was doing a calibration measurement with the, with the big comp system here and these measurements perfectly agreed. And what you see here is the fractional overlapping Allen deviation of the smart comp helium neon laser bead node at 633 nanometers. And you can also see that this measurement here is limited by the maser itself because it starts in the 10 to the minus 12 uh, stability region here. The smart comp itself would be capable of supporting uh, the low 10 to the minus 13 level if you lock it <clears throat> to an optical reference, for example, then it would be even better. But also for our references, we can support down to 10 to the minus 13 level here. All right, so the next application I want to show you um, is, I would say, the main application of frequency comms and uh, if you use them as a laser frequency reference. So if you have a bunch of lasers and you want to stabilize this to your frequency comp, then our task, of course, is to provide the frequency comp light you need. So our fundamental comms always, well, most of the cases start at 15, around 15, 16 nanometers, and we have different techniques for frequency spreading and shifting the comp light, and also, for example, second harmonic generation to cover the complete visible spectrum. And how do we lock such a frequency, uh, a CW laser to the frequency comp? Well, very similar as shown before, we have the speed detection unit, which is a combiner and a filter, so it filters out the spectral part here you're interested in. The CW laser light comes in as one, as one input, the comp light at the target frequency is the other port, and then you measure the beat signal on a photodiode. And the beat signal again gives you the distance between your CW laser and the next neighboring comp mode. And then uh, we feed this to locking electronics and a direct digital synthesizer then is the local oscillator and defines the distance between the CW laser and the comp mode. Then you can phase lock or frequency lock your CW laser to uh, the comp. So, and this is uh, exactly what is done, for example, at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Garching. They have different labs. In total, there are seven labs which are working with uh, cold atom experiments. And they stabilize more than 25 lasers now to one Mendo Systems frequency comp. The comp itself is referenced to the MPQ maser. So also there are very nice radio frequency references available. And the comp then replaces wave meters, gas cells, and transfer cavities. And this is, of course, a very nice feature if you have one reference for, for all your lasers. And as you can see, the wavelength range here is from 770 to 795. 1064 is also available. And <clears throat> from the core system, 1560 nanometer. And the fiber length uh, can be as long as 50 meters here, of course, depending on the application you might need fiber noise cancellation. But I think in this case, this also worked without. And this is, of course, a very nice way to lock all lasers to one frequency reference. And uh, yeah, then, of course, we have to extend our systems if we want to provide light for different frequencies. And what you see here, this is a very big customized system. It's the easiest way to see how many CW lasers were locked to the compass to count the beat detection units here. So in total, we have eight. So eight. Uh, eight CW lasers were locked to the comp. You can see here the core system again, and here are four boxes, four amplifier boxes, each of them containing two amplifiers. And why so many amplifiers? We could also do a supercontinuum generation, of course, and lock all the lasers to the supercontinuum. Well, in this case, the customer was very keen to get the best possible beat signals uh, in terms of signal to noise ratio. So if you want to have signal to noise ratios uh, of the beat signals of around uh, 35 or even 40 dB, then of course you're usually limited 
by the power in one comp mode and to have the highest possible comp mode power at your target wavelength, we provide these dedicated boxes here with the amplifiers inside. Okay, um, another uh, very nice application I want to show you is again uh, with the smart comp. So we're very proud to announce that the smart comp is the world's first airborne frequency comp used for greenhouse gas monitoring. And what you can see here on the right is a picture of the inside of this airplane here from the German Aerospace Center in Oberpfaffenhofen. And the airplane is the high altitude long range research aircraft. And what was done here? Well, this aircraft here has a special LIDAR laser system. So what are they doing? Well, they're pointing a laser beam directly to the ground. And if they're flying around, pointing this quite big laser beam to the ground, a small portion of the light is Reflect, uh, is scattered from the ground and gets back to the detectors in the airplane. And this enables um, the system to do differential absorption spe spectroscopy and they can measure the concentration of carbon dioxide and methane in the air. So in this light pillar, they can really measure uh, the concentration of these greenhouse gases. And why do we need a smart comp here? Well, the so-called CHARM-F laser, which was sent out the airplane, operates at 1572 nanometer. It has its own reference, uh, a small gas cell, but due to pressure and temperature changes in the airplane, it might happen that the reference drifts a little bit. And they wanted to check this if the reference drift, and they used the smart comp as an absolute frequency reference here. So they did not lock the CHARM-F laser to the smart comp. They simply tracked the beat signal here over time. So this delta F between the CW laser and the comp mode. And if you track this over time, you might see effects of pressure changes or something. And then if you know, well, there was something, something happened, you can do a subsequent laser frequency correction in your data analysis. And this was, <clears throat> yeah, the goal of this so-called comet mission here. And the last, uh, the last application as a comp uh, used as a frequency reference uh, I want to show is this. This is the output of a high resolution shell spectrograph. And this uh, spectrograph is part of the so-called HARPS telescope, the High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher. And this is a 3.6 meter telescope facility in Chile operated by the European Southern Observatory. And what you see here on channel A, this is the stellar light which they collect in the telescope. And on channel B, you see the Menlo system's AstroComp light. So this is a specially designed comp with an especially high repetition rate of 18 gigahertz. And the combination of this very high repetition rate with the high resolution spectrograph then can really resolve the comp modes. And this is the most, yeah, the most beautiful application I'm, I'm aware of, where you can directly see the comp light and how they use it really as a frequency ruler. So you see all the comp modes here and you, yeah, then simply, you know the, the index N here and you can directly read read out the frequency of this stellar light here. And I also want to mention my colleagues, Thilo Steinmetz and uh, Joan Ji Wu, who really pushed the limits here and this AstroComp technology. This is uh, really impressive and we're very proud, of course, to work with the European Southern Observatory. This is all I wanted to tell you uh, about uh, using a frequency comp as a laser frequency reference. Next part, uh, our optical networks and fiber links. And one example here I've chosen, is the common clock very long baseline interferometry using a coherent optical fiber link. So the very long baseline interferometry is a technique in radio astronomy, a very powerful technique. And uh, the, yeah, the basic idea is that if you link two telescopes instead of using only one, you basically increase the effective numeric aperture. So in this case, it's a distance of 600 kilometers between these two telescopes and they so mimic a giant telescope. But this only works if the telescopes are very well synchronized to each other. So both of the telescopes have their local oscillators, their local clocks, and they synchronize their time and their data and do the data analysis. And they found out that they are still limited now by phase drifts between their two local clocks on each side. And this is why they decided, well, we could use a common clock link to get rid of these phase shifts between our clocks and further improve our resolution. And that's what they did. And if you share a common clock link, well, then just go for the best clocks available. So they asked the National Metrology Institute in Torino if they could provide uh, via fiber link their optical clock system, and they did. And how does this work? And why do you need frequency comps for that? Well, here's a scheme. The National Metrology Institute in Torino has the cesium fountain clock. A hydrogen maser is disciplined by this clock signal. <clears throat> and the hydrogen maser then gives you an output, for example, at 10 megahertz. 
And this 10 megahertz clock signal is now uh, the reference signal for the locking electronics, which defines the repetition rate of a frequency comp. So the comp itself is now face locked to this 10 megahertz clock signal. And then you need a transfer continuous wave laser at the C band usually, and you lock this to the comp, and then you have an up converted clock signal. This up converted clock signal is sent into the optical fiber link. It's split it here, one goes to Matera, one goes to Medicina. And what you do here to retrieve the clock signal, you do it the other way around. Now the comp is locked to the transfer laser and you simply measure the repetition rate on a fast photo diet. You divide this down and then you have again your 10 megahertz clock signal. And this is a very symmetric and very nice way of spreading a clock signal via an optical fiber link. All right, but not only uh, astronomers in Italy are, uh, are interested in this fiber link technique, uh, the whole of Europe is, and that's why there is the so-called Clonets, uh, Clonets network, the clock network service <clears throat> uh, of optical fiber links. And as you can see here um, on, on the right side, for example, the Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt in Braunschweig is connected to the Max Planck Institute in Garching, the link go via Strasbourg to the search in Paris, the NPL in London, here's the VSL in Delft, this will hopefully also be connected to the Europe spanning fiber link <clears throat> network. And down here you can see INRIM and Medicina and Matera, the fiber link I was just talking about. And in total there are I think uh, 18 18 partners for this project and one of them is Menlo Systems. Okay, so the last application I want to talk about in this talk is the dual comp spectroscopy. Um, and as the name suggests, for dual comp spectroscopy you need two comps. As you can see here, of course you have an atomic or molecular sample, you have a photodiet, a detector, and you need an R spectrum analyzer. So the, the pro side of this uh, dual comp spectroscopy setup, you have no moving parts other than, for example, the fast, uh, sorry, the Fourier transform, uh, Fourier transfer, transform interferometry, you don't have moving parts, there's no need for an optical spectrum analyzer, and you're very fast, and a single shot broadband measurement can be done within milliseconds, and of course, well, a single shot measurement will probably not provide the best signal to noise ratio, but if you have one shot within a millisecond, this also means you can average over 1000 shots in only one second. So still we are very fast and very precise. So the resolution is given by the repetition rate itself. And for molecular spectroscopy, this is uh, yeah, quite a very good resolution. So how does this really work? I will show you on the next slide. <clears throat> well, you have to use two comps and they have slightly detuned repetition rates. So if COMP1 has the repetition rate FR, then COMP2 is slightly detuned by delta FR. And this means here on the frequency axis, if these two red modes here coincide perfectly, then the yellow ones will have a distance of delta FR, the green ones here of two delta FR and so on. And these neighboring COMP modes will produce speed signals. Of course, exactly at the value delta FR, two delta FR, three delta FR and so on. And this means that you get a comp in the RF domain with a separation here of delta FR. And this also means if these comp lines here are <clears throat> going through your atomic or molecular sample and part of them getting absorbed, then also the beat signals will drop in intensity. So <clears throat> the absorption feature here in the optical domain is mapped down to the RF domain. And this is really the clue of the dual comp spectroscopy. And to show you an exemplary measurement, what can be done with this with a resolution of, in this case, 250 megahertz. Here's an exemplary measurement of acetylene. And you can see here, you can really resolve all the peaks, also the tiny peaks here, P9, so a very big peak. And what you see here, the blue dots are the dual comp spectroscopy measurements points, and uh, the red lines are the Hitron database. And even here down in this, well, yeah, forest of peaks, if you zoom in, you can resolve all these peaks here yeah, and this is a really, really fast and very nice way to do molecular spectroscopy. And I want to show you how such a system looks in reality. Here you can see the dual comp system at the EPFL in Lausanne, uh, which was uh, lent to the group of Tobias Kippenberg. And you see here, this is a fully recommended dual comp system. The comp itself is in these two drawers on the optical table. We just have a, a CW laser reference laser here, which has not 
uh, which is just intrinsically a relatively stable laser and an amplifier. So these two boxes are outside. The rest of the system is completely rack mounted. All the electronics and also the computer and the control software, everything is in this rack. So the basic data of this comp, 250 megahertz repetition rate, delta F rep was set to 310 hertz. For technical reasons, we can choose that. And the outputs from the amplifier box here were two times 430 milliwatt, which is quite a lot because the group of Tobias Gibbenberg wanted to do nanophotonic supercontinuum based mid infrared dual comp spectroscopy. And I can only highly recommend to read this paper. They have really nice results. Yeah, and this is all I wanted to tell you uh, for this part, but uh, stay tuned because now it's time for the product demo given by uh, my colleague Sandra de Vega, who is sales engineer for optical frequency comp and ultra stable lasers. And what we want to show you here, this is a demo video we uh, prepared last week. And what we want to show you here, here's a, a laser, a CW laser free running, just standing on, an, yeah, you see it's an office table. It's not a, it's not a laboratory table. And here's the smart comp and Sandra will now show you how we <clears throat> can measure the CW laser in a very convenient way with the smart comp. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you join the next webinar. Yeah, that's it from my side. Goodbye. Sorry. There we go. So hello everyone. I hope you are enjoying the seminar uh, so far. Uh, okay, so what we have here is the, the smart comp, which is our most compact frequency comp, and it has everything inside. So all the optics, all the control electronics, everything is inside this box that you can see here. So uh, typically, the smart comp comes with a bit detection unit at 1542 nanometers, but we can put another two bit detection units at the wavelength that you want. So. Uh, what you see here are the ports, so one for input, another for the output. But you can have up to two input ports and up to six uh, outputs. So it would go in a square all the way here. Uh, here we have the spectrum analyzer for detecting the bit signal. And here is the basically a touch screen which controls the smartcom. And uh, it's basically uh, a copy of what we can do also remotely with the laptop. So in this case, we will work with, with the laptop. So the first thing that you would need to do to uh, switch it on is go to this drop down menu and change from standby to frequency comp. So what you see here is the repetition rate of the smart comp. And here in the other box is the carrier envelope offset frequency. So the repetition rate is fixed to 100 megahertz, uh, while the CEO frequency is up to 10, um, 10 megahertz. Um, so what we are going to measure, it's a Rio, Rio laser that you can see here, a CW laser. Uh, what we did before is um, basically measure it with a, with a wave meter so that we really know in which mode we are working. So this is already set. Okay, so while uh, I was uh, speaking, the repetition rate was, was log, and now it's fully green, ready to, ready to go. And also the CO frequency, it's, uh, it's log already. It usually takes around 30 seconds, so it's pretty fast for having both of them work. Okay, so now that everything is set, let me plug in the CW laser. Okay, just one second. And then just look at the spectrum analyzer. So what you see here is the bit signal uh, of the CW laser with the with the comb. And just to figure out what is the sign of this bit signal, because it can be negative or positive, but we will see it better later on. What I will do is to change the repetition rate, and then you will see how this will move. So if I go to the software, I click here, and then I start uh, switching this up so you can see how it moves uh, to the right. So it increases. What it implies that the um, uh, bit signal is negative. So this will be useful to later on calculate the proper frequency of the laser. So if we now go to the um, uh, software analysis 
and if I click center, what you see here is the uh, signal of the bit that goes up to 31 megahertz. So knowing this and knowing that is in between 5 uh, and minus 5 megahertz, we have already fully characterized the, the CW laser. So I will now explain a bit uh, how we really determine this um, sign of the, um, of the bit signal. So, but this is everything that you would need to do to measure properly the frequency of the CW laser. So, see you in a second. Hi again. So, what I want to show you here is how we determine the sign of the bit signal and also the frequency of the CW laser that we are measuring. So, what you see here is the representation of the frequency comb that we have already seen throughout this webinar. So, here you see all the different modes and the spacing will be the repetition rate. So as we have said, the frequency of the CW laser will be given by the frequency of the mode n that we already know because we have measured it with a, a wave meter and also the frequency of the bit. So if you see here, this uh, red line could correspond to the frequency of the CW laser that we want to measure precisely and here we have the mode n that we already know. So the spacing between these two is the bit signal. And a way to know if this is basically to the left or to the right of this, uh, of this mode is by increasing slowly the repetition rate. So when we do this, you can see that the bit signal increases as we saw in the spectrum analyzer. This implies that the frequency of the CW laser lies to the left of this, of this mode. So we need to subtract the bit signal to the uh, frequency of this mode. So just uh, by doing this, this we have already measured as, as I've just said in the spectrum analyzer and also later on in the uh, analysis software we saw that the bit of the signal was 31 megahertz or so. So with this we just figure out what is the frequency of our laser and that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Doug, for the presentation. And thank you also, Sandra, for this nice video and the product demonstration. We have um, two minutes left for questions. There are still questions that are open, which I would like to read out for Doug. Um, there would be the question about, what is the best strategy to account for non-equal intensities of comb lines in dual comb spectroscopy? And I will, I will turn off my video. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, well, this is a very good question. Um, <clears throat> The only thing I can say here is, <clears throat> uh, sorry, that um, of course you would uh, want a very flat spectrum, but this is usually limited by the intensity you need. Um, but indeed, um, the only way I could think of getting rid of this is, of course, do reference measurements with the dual comp without the sample and then subtract it. But because you will, of course, never get rid of all the, uh, yeah, of all the difference and differences in the intensity. Um, yeah, so I, I would suggest uh, to make a, a reference measurement without without the atomic probe, or make the system yeah to to get rid of the of the dual comp induced uh, features, so to say. Okay, then there is the second question. Let me just see. Um... If you put all the optical components and electrical components in a small box, like in the smart comb, how do you deal with the um, electrical influence, heat and vibration, etc., on the frequency comb? Yeah, that's also a very good question. Well, this is uh, the art of engineering, I would say. Uh, the optics is separated in an in, in an inner box, which is uh, really rigidly mounted. And of course, uh, yeah, it's designed in such a way that these impacts are as small as possible. And uh, as I have shown, uh, we can, yeah, of course, it's uh, for the um, 
high-end applications, we would uh, for now uh, go to the scientific system, but also the smart comp is capable with all the electronics in the box to be stable and it automatically stabilizes everything. So yeah, you're very good to go there. And uh, also the, the electrical influences and the thermal influences are just canceled out by the uh, active stabilization of the optics. Okay, so I think we are now running out of time. So we should leave the rest of the questions to be opened um, privately in the Q&A chat, or we will also answer them via email if that's possible. Um, once again, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you for the questions. And I would like to remind you for those who joined the webinar later that the registration is open for the second part of our webinar. It will be on Tuesday in a week's time at the same time as today. If you have any further questions, if you, we are encouraging you to continue the, um, the conversation with us, please contact us on sales at mendelsystems.com. Also, if you just want to have a nice mental t-shirt from us, please write us. With this, I would like to thank everybody and say goodbye. Thank you. And it was a great presentation from Menlo. Um, I appreciate you all sticking around until the very end. Um, for those of you who were asking about um, a link to the presentation, if you actually go on the website, which I sent um, in the chat box, you'll be able to see the site for today's webinar. Um, you'll be able to see the recording there posted in the next couple of days. Um, Menlo has also provided some additional um, supplemental information, which is posted on the website right now. So you're welcome to um, review a copy of these slides and additional material that they've shared as well. Um, and then if you're interested in registering for their second webinar, as Pitsurcia mentioned, um, the link for that is also in the chat box. So I encourage all of you to come back for part two next week. Um, DAG will be presenting again. Um, and they have a great uh, topic lined up for that one as well. So thank you guys all again, and we hope to see you next week. Take care, bye-bye.